Hello, welcome to SciShow Talk Show. That day on SciShow, we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. Today, we're talking to my very good friend, Brian Von Osberg. We went to school together, and we indeed sat next to each other at the first day of graduate school, and you had Googled me. I had Googled you. I had stalked you a little bit online. I had not done that to you. <laughs> but you were like, you're into Mars. And I was like, I am into Mars. And we talked about Mars a bunch, because Brian worked on our first ever mission, uh, rover mission to Mars, Pathfinder, yep. which when I was 17 years old, and you were working at JPL, <laughs> uh, was a really, really big deal for, for young me. Yeah. So I appreciate you doing that. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure. And you also worked on some other stuff at JPL, the Hubble mirror replacement. Yep, on the camera system that was inside of Hubble that restored the visioning. Yeah, we was like, oh, Hubble, it's great. And uh, we can see <laughs> a lot less than we expected. Yeah, so we took a big camera out, put a new camera in, um, big, exciting multi-day spacewalk. Well, we didn't do it. The astronauts <laughs> did it. Um, but we worked on the camera system that uh, fixed the, the right. imaging issue. But let's mostly talk about Mars, if that's okay with you. That would be Because great. it's my favorite planet aside from Earth. What parts of Pathfinder had your fingerprints on it? So I worked on what we called the Martian igloo. If you've seen the Martian, there is this big white structure with the JPL logo and the flag uh, mm -hmm. on the back of it. And Mark Watney goes out to retrieve it, to use it to restore communications with, with mm -hmm. Earth. And it's that white structure uh, called the ISA, the Insulated Structural Assembly. Mm -hmm. And it had to keep the electronics on the inside um, insulated from the Martian temperatures. And then it had all of this stuff mounted on the outside, including the high gain antenna, and the camera system that took you know, the 3D pictures of, of Mars. So it was that structure. And, and when I got assigned to be the, the project lead on that, you know, it's like, okay, we need this thing. It needs to <laughs> occupy this sort of space. Right. It needs to, here's a budget. Um, <laughs> you need to spend we're going money. to launch, like, you know, there's here's a launch window to get to Mars, you know, so we're gonna have to test these things in you know, months or years down the road. And it needs to survive this landing where it's going to like come down and it's going to bounce around on the surface of Mars. Right, the, the, and you can't the, use the, any metal. Oh, no metal allowed? Because no it's too heavy. Actually, because it would have been a thermal short, a, a thermal okay. conductor from the inside environment to the outside. Okay. And so you kind of sit there and you get these More requirements insulating. and you're like, uh, yeah. It's going to bounce on. It's got to bounce. Yeah. We've developed a few different landing systems for Mars. Uh, but Pathfinder used was the first to use this airbag system yep. where it was like it just like a bunch of balloons inflated <laughs> around it. I mean, who whose idea was this? I sort of got an idea of how this the ISA came together is like here's what it needs to do and what's the budget and what's the deadlines and the materials we need to use. Yep. But when you're like, okay, but we need to land on the surface, who's like, I know, cloth balloons. Yeah. I, I would love to be able to tell you that I was yeah. in the early, uh, no, no, and, I, no. and I wasn't, but I can tell you that there was a lot of discussion all throughout the mission because, you know, the engineers would get together or the engineers would go off to their home lives and go to parties and mm -hmm. people would ask you, what are you working on? And you're like, oh, this mission to Mars, and let me tell you how it's going to land. And people would be like, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, are there, there seems to be a number of ways to do it that isn't that way. Yeah, but the thing was, it was going to be like much, much less expensive. So the right. whole thing was, yeah. how can we get there for a fraction of the cost that the Viking missions in the 70s got right. there? Was the bounty landing done again? Yeah, the most important aspect, arguably, to our mission. I mean, Pathfinder did some science. Mm -hmm. uh, it operated, you know, a few months. It was aimed at proving that we could get there this crazy way. Mm -hmm. And um, and we were successful with that. Because it, at that time, you know, it was. I mean, even engineers on the mission were like, this is insane. You know, the idea of not doing a controlled landing on the surface. So it was just parachutes and bouncy balls. It was parachutes. It was some rockets. Oh, so and some so rockets. as it as it got to, to Mars, it didn't even go into orbit. It just got to Mars right into the atmosphere. It took seven months <laughs> to get to Mars. So let's, so to get to, to, to get out of Earth orbit and on a trajectory to Mars, you're going fast. Yeah. You're going fast. And, and sometimes what you do is you try and get into a stable orbit, slow down yeah. some. You're just like, I'm a bullet headed to Mars. Yeah, why waste time with orbiting? Let's get there as fast as we can. We get there. Pathfinder didn't even go into orbit. It just went right into the atmosphere. And now, suddenly, the problem is the opposite. It's we got to slow down um, too fast. quickly. Yeah. And so the first thing was to deploy this parachute, and it had a heat shield. And so 
you're using friction yeah. from the, the thin good. atmosphere. It's good that the atmosphere is there. Because if yeah. you're going very fast, it's enough. It, it, it's still it's, like it's hitting a brick wall. And the parachute made it go from very, very, very fast to just, you know, very fast. And then the, the part that gets even cooler, I think, is it got to a certain point off of the surface of Mars, and it's using a radar system to detect how far up it is. Nominally, this thing is sort of hovering, and boom, the airbags inflate. And then they fire and, and disconnect from the parachute yeah. and the rockets, and it just drops. And, and, the, <laughs> and I think it wound up bouncing. So it drops, bounces way up into the atmosphere. Bounce, 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 bounce. I think it bounced like at least 15 times, something like between 15 <laughs> and 20 times. Time. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's bouncing and it's rotating and it's spinning. And inside of these airbags, it's this tetrahedron with these three petals that can unfold and a, a base pedal is what we called it. And then the structure my team was responsible was sitting on that base pedal. So the, so the next thing you start thinking through is you don't know which pedal you're going to land on. Right. And so this was, was this was my thought as a 17 year old. I was like, how are they going to know which pedal it land? Like I didn't say pedal, yeah. but one in yeah. four chance. <laughs> yeah, as if we like, cross your fingers. Yeah. And so each <laughs> each of the pedals, the hinge mechanism was strong enough that if it landed on the, the wrong one, right. it could flip itself onto the right one. Mm. Um, we got lucky, it actually did land uh, on, the, on the base pedal. And so um, I was uh, sitting on a couch in the Bay Area of California uh, in my boxers watching a NASA feed on TV and you were waiting. Everyone's this is how waiting. you find out? Yes. You don't get to like go to the special room? I think I could have, but at that point I had left JPL. <laughs> okay. So I was, I was no longer working there. So I'm watching this in the privacy, fortunately, for all of the neighbors uh, of my living room. And at that point, you're waiting for a signal. I think they call it a semaphore, yeah. saying, from the spacecraft, saying, I landed and I'm alive. There, there are parts of me that still work. Yes, yes. <laughs> These and, parts. And that signal came in, and that was your, you know, now everybody has seen multiple of these moments of all of mission control, yeah. you know, standing up and crying. And I leapt off the couch, um, I was screaming, I was crying, I opened the sliding glass door, ran out into the backyard. Then all of these other magical things started happening, right. which was unrolling you know, the, the pathway for the rover to actually like get down and then roll mm -hmm. off one of this the pedals. Little, like runway comes little down. Little runway, yeah. <laughs> yep. And it's like, let's start you know, doing science. And then the camera system, you know, went up and it's got two eyes to give you that depth perception yeah. and it starts, you know, doing its thing. And it was, it was very, it, just talking about it, like, is very nostalgic for me. <laughs> it was a huge deal for, like, that summer was a great, great uh, nerdy time in my life. That makes my heart happy. <laughs> Good. <Yeah. laughs> so what's sort of like day to day when you were working on this? I mean, is there always sort of a sense of like, like how... I always feel like, boy, I sure am putting a lot of energy into something that might just turn into dust yeah. when it hits a planet going 20,000 miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, day to day on that mission was uh, an adventure because, you know, some days it's just like, okay, we got to, you know, get this much designed or built or we got to get this to this testing or, or whatever. Um, but I think the thing that goes unappreciated uh, probably from the outside is just how many twists and turns there are in that process. I, I think and I was telling you a story. how many problems need to get solved. Yeah, the first big test of the airbags, which wasn't my system, but I remember the engineer coming in and showing a videotape, catastrophic failure. And the inspirational part of that was so that So like the this, bag popped and it was just over. Yeah, the bag yeah. popped. The, the first full-scale test of the airbag uh, with an upside-down catapult <laughs> that fired this, right, you it's know, still going fast. this model uh, yeah. with these airbags, it, it hit a Martian rock, you know, that we you had put created. Some rocks down. Yep, and, and it just failed. And the, the, but the beautiful thing was that we all sat around, we watched this videotape on an old VCR of his test because it happened somewhere in Texas. And, there, and then there was just like an hour of brainstorming. And mm -hmm. the, the awesome thing was that the redesign of the airbags that came out of that brainstorming an hour later is ultimately what successfully flew mm. on the mission and worked. I had numerous experiences with my teams, the ISA, where we thought we were gonna build the structure this certain way. And I remember we did the first full scale test assembly of how we we're gonna, and total failure. <laughs> and, and so, you know, when you ask like, what was it from day to day? So that day, you know, suddenly everything changed and we went into redesign mode for months. Some days were predictable. Yeah. A lot of days were not. Um, and, and you're interacting with all of the other engineers who have other things that touch yours or yeah. attach to yours. I 
couldn't possibly have appreciated it enough when I was there and now in retrospect, it's, uh, it's amazing. All right, well, I think we're gonna hang out with something. I don't know what it is, it's definitely not from Mars. And uh, carbon-based life Some carbon-based life form, yeah. yes. Hey, Jesse. Hey. What you got? I have a, a little tiny guy. Uh-oh. He's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> from Earth. His name is Goma. It's a tardigrade. <laughs> but that would be difficult. <laughs> All right, he's sleeping right now because he's nocturnal. I see a bunch of leaves. <laughs> yes, no. No, he, he's going to live in a bunch of leaves, and he's going to try really hard to pretend he is a leaf during the day. So he has amazing camouflage. I mean, you say that, but he looks like a freaking piece of winter green gum. <laughs> well, That's this a, isn't the exact this, plant he would okay. be living on. Yeah. Um, he would live on like bromids. Bromeliads? Bromeliads, thank you. Ooh. I can't say it. Well, yeah, do you know what he is? He's a frog. It's I a mean, frog. definitely a frog. Tree frog. Yeah. So, tree frogs, they live in the trees um, and they do not swim. But they are wet. Like this. They always have to stay wet. So, they're yeah. amphibians. Yes. So, they always have to stay wet. There he goes. There he goes. <clears throat> oh, my eyes are very bright. Oh, what? <gasps> yes. That was unexpected. Isn't that amazing? Change. That is called dimatic behavior. So when an animal that's mostly camouflaged all of a sudden tries to freak you out, right. you know, <laughs> it, it's, it tries to scare you away. So think of like those butterflies or moths that have the eye, like the owl eyes yeah. on them or the frilled lizards that, you know. Um, so this is dimatic behavior and those big, bright, yeah. red eyes are gonna try and scare you away. And he's got blue what arms, blue? he's got amazing? weird stripes and orange feet. Yes. You are nuts. He's beautiful. Isn't he amazing? And I'm not okay. gonna let you, I'm not, no, yeah. I'm not gonna let you touch him. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, Good jump. Yeah, these guys can jump. Usually frogs can jump about 50 times their body length. Whoa. So he'd, he'd be able to jump like, like five feet. Nah, not like 10 feet, but like five feet. <laughs> well, yeah. I think I'd make it. I feel so like I'd be able to get onto the camera there. <laughs> yeah. Stick right there. These guys are going to be native to Mexico, down through Central America, and then Colombia. And they live in any neotropic area. They just hang out where it's really wet and damp, and uh, they do their thing. Like I said, they're nocturnal, and they hide most of the day. They look really like inconspicuous during the day. Like you saw, there's just like. Yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah, it was like, here. I'm one single color, and now I'm like, I have all the colors. Beautiful, yeah. So this is also aposomatic coloration, so that would mean like warning colors, like I am poisonous or venomous. Mm -hmm. um, but they do try and scare you with their, their big bright eyes too. Oh, I love poisonous. these guys. They are not poisonous. <laughs> so I could eat them. <laughs> you could. Maybe you, you could had eat the, the antivenom in your system or something. Right? Oh, good job, <laughs> You are, and also just the ridiculousness of your limbs. They're like, so long. Are there bones in there? That's Definitely ridiculous. Bones. <laughs> but so cool. And what I think is one of the coolest things about frogs, is, I mean, what do you think the coolest thing about frogs is? That, I mean, I thought the weird part was your eyeballs and, whoa, whoa but no, your, your body structure is the weird part. Cool, but look, he was hanging upside down, Yeah. right? So his feet, he He's has sticky, sticky pads feet. on his feet. Yeah. So they are not like gecko feet. They don't have like the dry stick kind of that, um, that geckos do, it's a, it's a wet sticky. And so they have, if you look really, 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 I mean, we can't really see it. Um, but if you look at <laughs> a micro, under a microscope, you'll yeah. see that there are these like hexagonal shapes. They're all squished together. And then at the very tip of them, they have this little dimple. And so that would create a little bit of friction and uh, really good friction there. But also the cool part is that they have, um, they secrete mucus in between them and that creates okay. even more intense stick and adhesion power. They're studying these guys right now to see if they can figure out self-cleaning adhesives because they are self-cleaning. So as they mm -hmm. move around, um, the mucus moves more and they leave behind the debris and stuff. And so that the more steps they take, the better ad adhesion they can get. Oh, it's just so cool. Are yeah. the eyes independent or do they always try? No, they, can, they actually can't even move. Oh, they don't uh, move at no, all. They don't move in the socket. Okay. So they turn their head to see things. And um, so forward-facing eyes, these guys are hunters. Yep. Uh, so they need to get that binocular vision so that they can lunge and towards their prey because a lot of people think that frogs have like these long chameleon-like tongues. They don't. They no don't. frogs? Um, there are some that have longer tongues, but none 
are like chameleons, where it's like, pro, you know, like that yeah. squishy and then it propels us out. Yeah, no. that's, a, that's a cartoon thing. Yes, it is. Um, so, yeah, they combine two different animals. And, uh, <laughs> but these guys have, they, it's like a half inch tongue, so I mean, it's still pretty yeah. substantial for his size, but they're lungers. So he would locate his prey and then he'd jump towards them. He does, sticks out his little sticky tongue and then chomps down on them. And then they do the cool thing where they get inside their mouth and so their tongue is attached to the front of their mouth there instead of like going down the back of their throat. Yeah. So they don't swallow with their tongue. Do you know what they swallow with? Oh yeah, I do. Yeah, <laughs> their eyeballs. They swallow with Whoa. their eyeballs. Really? Yeah. yeah, so they get the food in their mouth and then they blink and their huge eyeballs push the food down their throat. Wow. And it's really cool. <laughs> 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 yeah, do you want to try and hold him? Uh, I thought I wasn't allowed to. Um, he's settled down now. Okay. So what I want you to do is kind of stick your hands up like that. I'm going to see if he wants to move onto your hands. Wow. Oh. What does it feel he's like? So, he's cold, but other than that, like nothing. He's very small. Yeah. Teeny, like, teeny, um, tiny. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, just not a, like, a difficult to, de to detect amount of weight. Yeah. But you me. can feel like some pressure. It's like yeah. a little sticky pressure. And he's, he's not super cold. He's the same temperature as the air around us. Okay. Which is colder than us, so it does yeah. feel cold. Yeah. Yeah, right there. Wasn't that blue on the side? It's cool too. I know, yeah, it looks, looks very weird. Yeah. I mean, those long, weird, spindly legs. What's that about? Is that just for like distance jumping? Jumping, jumping, yeah. But they yeah. don't even look like they're attached to his body. They're just like <laughs> sitting on top. <laughs> it's like a grasshopper. It looks like a grasshopper. Yeah. Do you want to try holding him? Sure. Have you put lotion on your hands? No, I haven't. Okay. And do you know why we put and he won't want to go down, so okay. turn, turn your I'll hand like that and like try this. and, yep, and I'll try and scooch him up onto your hand. You big buddy. There you wait, go. Wait, wait, wait. There you go. Oh, hi. Nice. Oh, my daughter is going to be Blink. so jealous. Good job, buddy. What he's doing you? amazing. Oh, that's cool. Because he's, it looks like he's getting ready to jump yeah. on it. I'll just put my hand out there in case he wants to jump onto it. Ah, Secondary buddy, you're so cool. back up jump place. So do you guys know why we have to put water on our hands? Yay, Thank you. good job. No. So amphibians can absorb a lot of stuff through their skin. So they don't they breathe through their skin. They have oxygen exchange through their skin, but they also can absorb a lot of toxins. Do you want to stick your hand out like that in case he wants to jump again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he takes good cues job, very well. <laughs> Are you really interested in places He's to on go the move. now? We should put him back on here just so he doesn't get stressed out. You know, yeah, he's like, I'm next, running away and I don't know where I'm going. Leaf. Next place might have been Hank's glasses. Leaf. Oh, I love you. <laughs> there. <laughs> Good job. We have had a frog jump on someone's glasses before. <laughs> there was one that ended it up in like your hair. It was like an 85 year old lady and it was amazing. And she just started laughing. It was great. It was great. Oh, he's going to tuck himself in there again. Yeah. yeah. You go back to sleep, buddy. So when they breed, the males are smaller than the females. They'll cling to their back and then the females will send out their, their eggs and they'll be fertilized. And they usually glue them using a, a kind of a, a mucus. They glue them onto a, a leaf above water. Um, so they're not going to actually lay them in water, which is why these guys have to, they're neotropical and they have to stay moist. So sometimes they'll fold the, the leaf over and stick it together and they'll stay nice and protected there. Mm. And this is the cool part. I mean, they'll hatch between six and 10 days, but if there's some like big scary thing that's gonna happen and they're going to die, they can rapidly develop and they, like, if a flood mm. is coming and, you know, they're covered in water, they're like, well, I'm going to develop and hatch and, and get out of there super fast. So they mm. sense that through their environment? Yes. That there's some sort of yes. like danger. danger? Yes. That would be a handy um, thing for us to develop. Yeah, go, yeah, it's just go. like, ah, oh, this pregnancy <laughs> is unpleasant. Can I just give birth in four months? Thank you. <laughs> Oh, it's so cool though. So yeah, so they'll sense danger and predators too. If predators are coming wow. along, they'll sense that too, the, some vibrations. Just, so it doesn't, so just doesn't hit my pants. Okay. The yeah. joints are just, it's, I mean, Incredible, right? it's like they're not even attached, but yeah, it's very so weird. strongly armed. Good go. job. Nice job. A good it's job. like getting hit with a tiny water balloon. <laughs> Oh, that's nice. That's nice, Jesse. Thank you for the wetness. <laughs> settle in, settle in. There you go. Are yeah. there like lots of species of tree frogs? There's a ton of, oh, yeah. of tree frogs, yeah. But these guys okay, are the, the prettiest, I think. They're so pretty. So much Incredible. blue. It's weird to see blue on an animal. Yeah. It's neat. 
Isn't he? I mean, mostly when they're blue, they're gonna be, they're trying to pretend that they're poisonous. Yeah, yeah. I'd buy it. I don't want to eat you. I wouldn't. I wouldn't eat an animal that looks like this. <laughs> nope. Yeah. No, but he's chill. But you're super nice. Yeah. Thank you, little buddy. <laughs> I love the throat action. Yeah, is he making? That's little... Gueller breathing. So he breathes through his skin, but he also breathes through his nostrils a bit, and he doesn't have like the the same Lungs. breathing mechanism yeah. that we do, and so he actually has to create um, pressure by pulling out his, his neck yeah. like that and then pulls the air in and then pushes it out. Wow. It's cool. Well, I like you very much. Thank you for coming on SciShow Talk Show. Likewise, Jesse. Thank you. Always astounding me that there are animals I haven't met yet. You can find Jesse at youtube.com slash Animal Wonders Montana. Find out all the ways that she takes care of all the amazing animals she has. And you don't have to smell any of it. <laughs> I uh, do all that for you. <laughs> uh, Brian, thank you. Thank it's you. always good to hang out. It Thanks was, for coming by. I'm honor. surprised it's taken so long to have that chat. I'm Maybe really, next time really we excited. can go deeper. Yeah. I'm happy <laughs> to talk to you about science stuff any day. Uh, and thank you for watching. We're at youtube.com slash scishow. We talk about science. Sometimes we talk about science with cool people. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs>